It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, my, my question to the, um, to the Deputy Premier. Um, Deputy Premier, at the Justice Committee today, we saw um, one of your Liberal members uh, conducting uh, himself in a way that clearly is putting the interests of the Liberal Party ahead of the interests of taxpayers in the province of Ontario. I'm, um, I'm worried that there has been direction from uh, the Premier or the Premier's office to try to turn a committee, instead of trying to get answers for taxpayers on why you cancel gas plans, the cost of committee and why you engaged in an orchestrated cover-up, to try to turn that into a circus instead of actually getting answers for committees. So let me ask the, um, the Deputy Premier. In light of this approach Liberals are taking to create chaos instead of get answers Question. from taxpayers, will you support our call for a full judicial inquiry into the gas plan scam? Thank you. You see me, please? You see me, please? Thank you. Well, uh, Speaker, um, thanks. Thank you to the uh, to the leader of the opposition for the question, and I am delighted to know Minister that he actually appeared at committee this morning. But that is no fantastic answer. and a big and important step. No answer. I am, however, terribly disappointed to learn that he had no answers yep. to no answer. any of the questions yep. no that answer. were asked. Yep. Speaker, he appeared, and we applaud him for appearing. But unfortunately. The answers were simply lacking in any substance. In stark contrast Member to the Barry, speaker, come to order. who appeared before the committee, she answered questions. Yeah. She's committed to being open. Nobody wants to get uh, the answers to these questions more than our premier, and her actions are demonstrating that. Thank you, supplementary. Well, yeah, um, thanks, speaker. Back to the um, deputy premier. I, I will say, and I'll. Give credit where credit is due. The, the former energy minister, uh, Ms. Cansfield, member of Tobacco Centre, did conduct herself and ask responsible questions that were productive, and we commend her um, for that. But there's certainly a different tone for your members. So I wanted to see who was making the calls. Was it member for Vaughan acting on his own, or was it Tobacco Centre? And, and clearly, then, when the deputy premier gives me that kind of answer, your approach on this gas plant committee obviously then is to create as much chaos as possible instead of trying to get responsible answers for taxpayers who are stuck with the bill. I, I find that, that highly regrettable. I expected better from Kathleen Wynne, but she has chosen her course. Uh, again, in light of this orchestrated attempt by the Liberals. Um, just quickly, I'm going to remind uh, the, the leader uh, to use the title or the writing, please. Speaker, I apologize. I expected better from from Premier Wynne. Um, so let me ask you in your capacity as Deputy Premier, given that your committee efforts show no interest in actually getting answers to taxpayers on the cost of the cancellation of the gas plan, so again, why not then support a judicial inquiry that can compel Thank truthful you. testimony and get answers for taxpayers? Thank you. Thank you. I think it's important that we review the actions that the Premier has taken since she became Premier of this province. Yeah. Speaker. She is taking full responsibility for uh, improving the planning of these large energy projects. Speaker, the, This new approach will include strong public consultation. It will include formal municipal input. Member from it Huron, will come to order. better decision-making. This report will come back to us by August the 1st. Speaker. I think that's a very important piece of what we need to do to fix the problems that got us to where we are today. In addition, she's written to the Auditor General, uh, asked him to uh, uh, review Oakville. He's agreed to do that. She immediately called the House back, Speaker, immediately uh, called the House back and struck committees, expanded the scope of the committee, offered documents from across government. Thank I you. am extremely proud of what our Premier Thank has you. done, and I only wish the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Final supplementary. <laughs> the, um, and I respond to the Deputy Premier with, with respect. Uh, the Premier has failed to apologize. Um, she has um, not uh, given uh, direct or straight answers on some pretty basic questions about what she knew and, and when. And you know, clearly was there at the Cabinet table at Dalton McGinty's right hand when they chose to cover up this um, information. So let me ask uh, again to the Deputy Premier, I, I think the motive of the Liberals was revealed today by the actions of your members at committee, which is more so to obscure facts, to throw mud 
instead of getting answers for taxpayers at the end of the day. So let me um, ask an important question. That if, if you Minister directly, of the Environment, come to order. I guess what's wrong with this? What is wrong with having a judicial inquiry, just like we saw with Justice Gomery, that can compel truthful testimony, get answers, and will it take the threat of jail, jail doors closing question. behind members from the Liberals to actually compel truthful testimony and get answers from taxpayers? Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Oh, Mr. Speaker, let's let's talk for a second about uh, this this call for so-called judicial inquiry. I'd like to quote an expert in the field, actually a noted expert in public policy. He had this to say, Mr. Speaker: the cost of a public inquiry is excessive. We don't believe that that's necessary. We're paid as individuals to represent our constituents and to hold the government, Who and that's that? where we expect this this hearing to take place. Mr. Speaker, that was the member from Cambridge who Are said that. Right? So basically, Mr. Speaker, we have a leader of the opposition who stood there in that field on YouTube and said, if he was premier, it'd be done, done, done. done, done, done. So, and he is standing today, Mr. Mr. Speaker, to ask for a judicial inquiry that his members oppose into a decision that Answer. he supported, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Leader of the Opposition. Back, um, back to the Deputy uh, Premier, and, and I do hope that you'll uh, take the time, Deputy Premier, to answer my questions instead of engaging in the types of games that your House Leader tends to do. Um, we've been very clear for months now that we believe in a full judicial inquiry. Just like we saw Justice Gomery with the sponsorship scandal uh, involving the uh, Liberals in, uh, in Quebec at a federal level, uh, we think a judicial inquiry is preferable, and at least my colleagues in NDP have put an option on the table on a public inquiry. We think judicial inquiry, though, will empower a judge to actually compel testimony uh, with the threat, quite frankly, if you do break the law by, by perjury. Uh, if you do, if it's found, have buried documents or intentionally destroyed documents. These are very serious accusations. That's why you support a judicial inquiry. So let me ask you, if you truly want to get answers for tax Question. Orders, why do you oppose a judicial inquiry to actually get the truth once and for all? Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition has the gall to talk about games. More I, watched, I watched his appearance in front of the Judicial Court, in front of the Committee this morning, in front of the Justice Committee. Mr. Speaker, 28 times, 28 times direct questions were put to the Leader of the Opposition. Simple questions like, what was his costing? Who did he consult when he made the decision to call for the cancellation of the plants? Even, Mr. Speaker, to acknowledge, acknowledge his opposition to the plants 28 times, Mr. Speaker, he would not answer a single question. I have not seen skating like that, Mr. Speaker, since I saw those old clips of Barbara Ann Scott on TV. Mr. Speaker, it was incredible to watch the evasiveness of the Leader of the Opposition, the fact that he will not hold the PC party even to a minimal standard of the way he is holding the government. Mr. Speaker, he should be apologizing and offering answers to those very straightforward questions today. Supplementary. Well, thank you, um, Speaker. And obviously, we can see what the Liberals are they're trying to do here. They're trying to um, create chaos. They're um, trying to uh, avoid uh, answering. They're trying to obscure the, the essential issues as much as possible. I, I think that's very clear now. I, I just want to say that that I find it regrettable that Premier Wynne is engaging in this. I thought she was going to be different. I thought she was going to take it down a different path, but she's engaged in the same old liberal games of obfuscation, dithering, and stonewalling. And that's why, Speaker, a government I lead will bring in a full judicial inquiry to get answers on behalf of taxpayers. Let me ask this in a different way, then. I think that a government so prepared to play these types of games, so prepared to bury the truth, and so prepared to put liberal interests ahead of taxpayers that clearly Question. you've lost the moral authority to govern. Will you call our confidence motion to the floor of the assembly to vote up or down whether we support this government or want to see it change? Thank you. 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 Mr. Speaker, obfuscation. Dithering, stonewalling, I think they are great descriptions of what we saw today from the Leader of the Opposition. Right. 
He would not, Mr. Speaker, he would not even acknowledge this pamphlet here that was passed out to thousands of Ontarians that said the following. The only party that will stop the Sherway power plant is the Ontario PC party. On October 6, vote Ontario PC. Mr. Speaker, we have Twitter. We have press releases. Mr. Speaker, we have newspaper clippings, and we have a YouTube video showing the leader of the opposition clearly opposed to the uh, Mississauga plan and his promise to cancel it if he was Premier, and yet he refused to acknowledge it today, Mr. Speaker. There was so much obfuscation. I have expected her to come up with the evil twin brother. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Final supplementary. Let me try the Deputy Premier one last time, um, Speaker, because, Deputy Premier, this uh, power plant scandal is extremely serious, and Ontarians would expect you to take it seriously as opposed to the uh, clownish approach of the House Leader, which is tend to turn this whole thing into a circus. Um, we all know the Liberals are willing to throw money at any kind of situation to try to save Liberal seats. That's clearly evident with Mississauga and Oakville. And now you're trying to throw money to buy the support of the NDP for a budget. In short, an NDP budget written by the Liberals to support Liberal seats. I don't think that's in the interest of taxpayers. I don't think that's in the interest of the 600,000 men and women who have no job to go to this morning, Mr. Speaker. I think clearly, if we want to restore hope to this great province of Ontario, if we want to get this province back on track to bring good jobs to Ontario, to respect every taxpayer dollar, to make sure that we live within our means and end these scandals, Question. it's time to change the government, Speaker. It's time to change the leadership and to put Ontario on the right track to make Ontario lead again. Call a motion. In the uh, in the thrust and no no in the thrust and parry of uh, of the house, uh, I may have missed an opportunity to ask a member to uh, withdraw. Um, under the circumstances, I do my best to try to hear all of the different, uh, and I do read my thesaurus as often as I can uh, to make any references that you're unparliamentary. And I also leave it to members themselves. If they find themselves in a situation that they can withdraw, they can withdraw themselves. So having said that, uh, I'll do my best to stay on top of things. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition just doesn't get it, Mr. Speaker. This is about the standards that they are holding the government to. We have a committee of the legislature which is looking into the decision to cancel the gas plants in Mississauga and Oakville. The simple fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, was that every single party of this legislature supported the cancellation of that plan. The Leader of the Opposition aggressively campaigned in the last election to do that, and he cannot appear in front of the Justice Committee this morning and deny that fact, Mr. Speaker. It is a matter of public record, and if he wants to talk about obfuscation, Mr. Speaker, he should be looking in the mirror, because his appearance in front of the committee this this morning was outrageous. 28 times, Mr. Speaker, he was asked direct questions on very, very simple matters, even to acknowledge the fact that he opposed the plan. And instead, Mr. Speaker, he decided to go for obfuscation, Mr. Speaker, and disrespect the committee and its member. Uh, stop. By, uh, by continuing to make that reference, I'm going to call everyone to order on that issue. So just tone it down. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, before I put my question, I'd like to, I think, take an opportunity on behalf of Ontarians and the members of the Legislature to uh, let the family of uh, Tim Bosma know that we are grieving with them. Uh, we found out today that uh, his remains were found uh, by the police, and his wife Charlene and his daughter and his mother Mary, I'm sure all their friends and family are grieving very much today, and uh, I think it's important that we uh, say that we're grieving along with them. Uh, speaker, my question is um, to the uh, Acting Premier. While the Premier has been campaigning speaker, and uh, electioneering around the province, New Democrats have been actually listening to Ontarians about their thoughts on the budget. and They're saying that the government has to do better if they expect Ontarians to trust them. Is the government going to listen to Ontarians speaker, and bring some accountability, some transparency and some fairness to their budget? Well, thank you, Speaker, and um, I, I, I too want to express the sincere condolences to the Bosma family. This is news that uh, that we have just received, and uh, 
I think all of us have hearts that are breaking as a result of that news. So um, we are with together on that uh, on that sentiment. But Speaker, as we move to uh, to the uh, to the to the budget and who's saying what about the budget, it might be helpful if we look at what some Ontarians are saying about the budget. Um, uh, Sid Ryan, I think the member opposite will know who Sid Ryan is. He is, of course, uh, a big supporter, a former NDP candidate. And uh, what Sid Ryan says is there are good things in this budget. I think we can work with in Labour, and I think the NDP Answer. can work with. Uh, Speaker, um, Fred Hahn, the president of QP, again, someone more well known perhaps to the members opposite than to Thank our you. side, says, I don't think Thank the you. people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, in the last 12 months, Ontarians have seen scandals grow at orange. They've learned that not one, but two premiers have hidden the true costs of moving the gas plants, and they learned that over a thousand people were given the wrong cancer medication. Does this government really believe that it is doing enough when it comes to accountability and oversight? Uh, speaker, so let's talk about what some other Ontarians are saying about the budget. Smokey Thomas, the president of OPSU, says, I don't see this as an election budget. Gail Nyberg, the executive director of the Daily Bread Food Bank, says, key initiatives in this budget will help more people afford to pay the rent and put food on the table, whether they're families with children or single people who are making the move from social assistance to employment. We encourage all parties to support the budget and the positive changes that will help low-income Ontarians facing poverty and hunger. Uh, Speaker Sarah Blackstock, who's with the 25 and 5 Network for Poverty Reduction, says, we think this budget is an opportunity to continue reducing poverty in Ontario. We are really eager to see the opposition parties work with the government yes, to ensure that we can continue making progress. Speaker, many Ontarians are weighing in, and, um, and, and they're pretty positive about this budget. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, after the budget was introduced, New Democrats asked Ontarians what they thought, but at the same time, the Liberals started printing election pamphlets and campaigning. New Democrats are interest in, interested in delivering real results for people, while the Liberals seem to be more interesting in their, interested in their own political power. Speaker. Will the government listen to people and bring accountability and transparency to their budget? So, Speaker, let's listen to what the Canadian Auto Workers and Communications Energy and Paper Workers Union has to say. The 2013-14 Ontario budget represents an important shift in emphasis by the provincial government and will make a positive difference in the lives of many Ontarians. David Coles, the national president of the Communications, Energy and Paper Workers Union, says this budget is proof that minority government can work to the advantage of working people. Ken Luenza, the national president of the Canadian Auto Workers, says these budget investments in our social and economic fabric are both badly needed and appreciated. Speaker, the people of Ontario have spoken. They have spoken loud and clear. Answer. This is exactly the right budget for these times, and I look forward to the third party supporting it. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the Minister of Finance. Is the Minister of Finance still committed to a poorly thought out network of tolled car carpool lanes that will cost Ontarians more than $300 million to build before they even generate a nickel? Mr. Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, I find it odd that the, uh, the third party, or for that matter, any of the opposition members, would feel that it's inappropriate to invest. In, in our infrastructure, in our public transit, in the construction of roads and bridges, enabling our gridlock to ease so that we can be more competitive in the long term. Uh, constructing more HOV lanes is about facilitating people to get to and from home more quickly, more safely. It's also about enabling our businesses and transports to get around the city and to get around Ontario more effectively. An hour in gridlock is an hour lost to their competitiveness. We have to invest more for the benefit of all Ontarians. 
Thank you, supplementary. Well, I find it surprising, Speaker, that this government's about to embark on a new Lexus Lane boondoggle in the province of Ontario. You know, well, the Premier has been sending uh, campaign staff to transit stations. New Democrats have actually been listening to Ontarians about what they think about transit. They think transit and transportation infrastructure should be funded fairly and transparently, Speaker, will the Finance Minister commit to cancelling this poorly thought out and outrageously expensive tolled carpooling? Minister? So, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to allow the Minister of Transport to speak in a moment, but I think it's essential that we all appreciate and understand that we need to continue to invest to be competitive in the long term. This is not about making election cycle decisions. This is not about playing partisan politics. It's about playing for the people of Ontario and constructing more HOV lanes to the member opposite to suggest that that is somehow inappropriate. It works in other jurisdictions around North America. It eases gridlock. It enables things to move more quickly, more safely, more effectively. Don't be short-sighted about this. Don't play politics with this and don't spin it. This is about moving people quickly, more safely, and we have to be all together on yes, this sir. issue. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the government plans to spend $300 million to toll carpooling lanes. But whether it's gas plants, e-health, the Presto fare card system, which has ballooned to almost three times its initial cost, this government cannot seem to manage Ontario's money. Will the finance minister put his plan for a $300 million network of tolled carpool lanes on hold? Minister of Transport, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure where the leader of the third party gets her information. First of all, we are not tolling HOV lanes. There, there is an expansion of HOV lanes. The system of HOT lanes does not diminish by one car the access for people who have more than one vehicle to the entire system, including the HOT lanes. The, 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 the member of the third party said there's no plan. Mr. Speaker, the big move has been around since 2008. Mr. Speaker, KPMG put out a detailed study that, that explained in detail how HOT lanes work. So, Mr. Speaker, I am confused, given that there is a plan, there is a detailed explanation, how someone with a party where there's more, that, that really tops the charts for luxury car ownership can make those kinds of statements, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Good question. The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Minister of Health. Speaker, uh, the stench from Orange just continues to get more offensive. Last week at the public accounts hearing, we heard that the Director of Forensic Investigation Team at Orange confirmed that millions of public dollars were siphoned from health care into the MAZA scheme. At the same hearing, we heard that the director that the minister and her deputies put in charge of a new oversight program of Orange and his newly appointed staff have no experience in either air or ambulance services, none. And yet they're responsible now for overseeing a multi-million dollar organization that has serious Question. financial and organizational challenges. I want to know from the minister, who will she hold accountable for this last experience of incompetence? Thank you. The deputy Minister, Thank or you. will she? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Speaker, I have to say it saddens me to see the me member from Newmarket Aurora continuing to hammer on the very hardworking people who are making our air ambulance system work. He raises the issue about the experience at the Air Ambulance Oversight Branch in the ministry. So let me tell you, Speaker, there is plenty of expertise in land and air ambulance operations at my ministry's emergency health services branch. Let me just discuss some of the people, the staff who are experienced in land and ambulance operations. They include are the senior manager of operations, along with three senior field managers and the manager of investigation services, the senior management manager of corporate planning and regulatory compliance 
the senior manager of performance and quality management, the senior management of finance and corporate support, Answer. the manager of inspections, cert certification and regulatory compliance, policy and operational assessment, and financial planning, reporting, and monitoring. The member opposite Thank you. Just does not know what he's talking about. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Minister. I have a response, Speaker, but I'll hold it back. The fact of the matter is that the one program that this minister put in place to oversee Orange, the director has no experience in air ambulance. He admitted that at the committee hearings. Not one of the six people he hired to help him in oversight responsibility has any experience in either air or land ambulance. That is who we expect would have some experience. The minister knows full well that she and her deputy, Patricia Lee, her deputy minister, Mr. Saad, have yet one more time made a huge mistake in terms of their responsibility of oversight. I now want to know this. Does she know anything about this document that sets out the requirement for $20 million more expenditure every year to cover off the debt? that she allowed to incur. Is that $22 million included in the budget, or will she Thank allow you. a cutback in more health Thank care you. services at Orange to pay? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, the Air Ambulance Program Oversight Branch, on the other hand, has substantial expertise, expertise and experience in ensuring that transfer, transfer payment agencies are transparent, accountable, and get value for money when spending taxpayer dollars. That's their job. Richard Jackson, the member has mentioned, is the director of the EHSB and the AAPOB, has extensive experience in oversight of transfer payment agencies, including community colleges, private career colleges, the Ontario Student Assistance Program, Toronto's Children's Aid Societies, Children and Mental Health Agencies, Developmental Services Agencies, and Women's Shelters. Speaker, this is an expert in oversight, fiscal responsibility. I think this is exactly Answer. the kind of expertise that the member opposite would like to see looking over orange um, air ambulance services, Speaker. It's what he's been calling for, and it's what we've delivered. Thank you. New question? The member from Toronto, Dan Ford. Thank you, Speaker. The question to the Acting Premier. For months, Ontarians have been learning how interference by the Premier's office ratcheted up the cost of the gas plants. The Premier's Principal Secretary agreed to, quote, preserve the value of TransCanada's project. It's unaccountable. It doesn't respect Ontarians. Will the acting premier admit what everyone else knows, that the interference of Liberal political staff drove up the cost of the gas plant cancellation to more than half a billion dollars? Mr. Speaker, this is this is a matter that's been uh, discussed in great detail at uh, at committee. We've heard from a number of uh, different witnesses, and uh, including uh, Jameson Stevie, formerly of the uh, Premier's office, who testified that my discussions, and I quote, with Trans Canada were exploratory in nature. Sean Mullen, another uh, Premier's office employee, said we were not, and I quote, we were not authorized to, and we did not engage in any negotiation. And representatives from TC themselves, the gentleman Chris Breen, said they were certainly not negotiating in the sense of fine detail dollars and cents. Mr. Speaker, this is something that the uh, committee has looked at, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I think has been dealt with by the witnesses that have appeared uh, before the committee. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Acting Premier. The promises made by the Premier's office made it impossible for the Ontario Power Authority to negotiate a good deal for ratepayers. When the OPA made an offer to TransCanada to cancel the plant in Oakville, TransCanada turned them down. They said the Premier's office has given us a sweeter deal. Ontarians deserve accountability. They expect that their money will be spent wisely, not wasted on Liberal seats. Will the Premier, the Acting Premier, admit that the interference of senior political staff drove up costs so that Ontarians have to pay more? 
And Chief, here again, I think we have to go back to first principles. There were 19 gas plants that were cited in this province, and the government clearly acknowledges that in two of those cases we made an error. We went forward to the, the people of both Mississauga and Oakville, indeed the people of Ontario, and said that we would cancel those decisions. That would have costs associated with it. I remind the honourable member that his leader and his party, and indeed even himself in public comments, said the exact same thing. I would remind him that the leader of the opposition, despite the fact that he refused to answer 28 direct questions to him this morning, aggressively said that he would cancel the project. Mr. Speaker, there were to be costs associated with the cancellation of the project. We knew that. The leader of the New Democratic Party that knew that. The leader of the PC Party knew that. Everyone knew that, Mr. Speaker. We yes, listened sir. to the people of those communities and acted accordingly. And as to the detailed questions he's asking NDP today, they have all Thank been you. dealt with in front of the committee. Question. Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is to the minister responsible for women's issues. We all know that women play a very important role in the province and in this country, and approximately half of Canada's workforce is female. In 2011, female graduates from Ontario's colleges and universities made up nearly 60 per cent in total. Speaker, I'm a proud member of this government led by Ontario's first female premier, and our cabinet and caucus includes a large number of women. Unfortunately, Speaker, these successes do not translate into the private sector. Women are still critically underrepresented in private sector leadership positions in both management roles and on boards of directors. Several recent reports suggest that at that pace at which women in the private sector are reaching senior positions is slowing down, Question. not speeding up. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is our government doing to promote gender diversity in private thank sector? You. Minister thank responsible for women's issues. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Glengarry Prescott-Russell for this important question. We need to tackle this issue as a province, Speaker, because having in women in leadership roles drives innovation, improves corporate social responsibility, and paves the way to a greater number of women in senior executive roles. In fact, Speaker, research tells us that companies with high representation of women women in senior management positions and on the board outperform those with fewer women on key metrics in financial success. I'm proud that our government is doing our part by taking strong action to promote the benefits of gender diversity and equal representation in the private sector and on corporate boards and in senior management. In fact, page 291 of the, of the 2013 Ontario budget reaffirms the government's commitment to delivering programs that promote women's equality and addresses the lack of gender diversity on board yes, and in senior management of major businesses, not-profits, and other organizations, and we will enlist the Ontario Securities Commission to help us determine the best way to proceed thank you. on this disclosure issue. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that very comprehensive answer. The initiatives that the minister discussed are extremely important in helping ensure that Ontario's hard-working women are fairly represented in private sector leadership positions. While women are still underrepresented on corporate boards and in management positions, it has been shown that women can find great success in small, small businesses as well. Small businesses are the source of more jobs in Ontario than any other sector, and female-owned small businesses are one of the fastest-growing segments of the economy. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister. What is this government doing to provide women with the opportunities and the resources to become successful small business owners or operators? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And there is no doubt small businesses are the backbone of this province's economy. And small businesses, particularly those run by women, play an integral part in driving innovation, creating jobs, and growing the economy of Ontario. The Ontario's 2013 budget makes smart investments that will strengthen the economy and takes action to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. And it recognizes the importance of small business and entrepreneurship, and the budget is a testament to that. Through measures such as the Commercialization and Innovation Voucher Program, the establishment of Venture Capital Fund in partnership with the private sector, and more support for women entrepreneurs, uh, we see women being able to get their businesses off the ground through the help of our small business 
Enterprise Centers, the new micro lending initiative uh, that will help low income women build and grow their small businesses. Speaker, these initiatives Answer. are good for women and they're good for the province of Ontario. Speaker, thank you. Your question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning. Uh, speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. Uh, three months has passed since they promised to be, quote, open and transparent regarding the gas plant scandal, yet the Liberals continue to go to extraordinary efforts to keep the facts from the public. We've learned the email accounts of three of the former Premier's former staffers, including his chief of staff, no longer exist, Speaker, and can't be recovered. This despite a legal requirement to keep those records for five years before going to Ontario Archives. Vital documents that could have helped the Justice Committee get to the answers are conveniently missing. This warped version of open and transparent is not the kind of Ontario we want. My question, Speaker, is will you support our motion for non-confidence vote on your scandal-plagued government? Question. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, he has the gall to stand today and talk about transparency after the performance of his leader in front of the committee. 28 times, Mr. Speaker, he was asked direct questions, not complicated questions, Mr. Speaker, not even trick questions. We asked him to simply acknowledge the fact that he starred in a YouTube video saying if he was Premier of the province that this gas plant would be done, done, done. We asked him the simple question as to what was going to be his costing, what experts he had asked, who in his party had reached out to do the proper analysis, and Mr. Speaker, he put on his ice skates and avoided every single question. Mr. Speaker, we got no transparency from him, so if the Leader of the Opposition will not tell us, will the Honourable Member in his supplementary tell us whether he will encourage our Conservative candidates in those ridings to come forward? We've been asking them, we've been begging them, we've been pleading them. We want some answers, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. You know, we bring out sworn testimony and he brings out dance routines. We're getting tired of that. Let's move on to the destruction. Let's move on from the destruction of documents to the withholding of the real costs of this Liberal scandal and when you knew them. Michael Lyle of the Ontario Power Authority was asked at the Justice Committee last week when the Liberal government knew the Mississauga cancellation was much more than you publicly stated. His response Order. was, quote, they would have been aware that there were costs that had been paid more than the $190 million, quote, and that was back in July of 2012, Speaker. You Yet go. you and your cabinet colleagues Shameful. clung to that figure for nine months until the Auditor General told us what you already knew. This is failed leadership at its worst, Here's and it's time for a test of confidence. Will you support our motion tomorrow to allow a non-confidence vote in this legislature? Mr. Speaker, I would remind the honourable member that in the testimony of the Premier several weeks ago, she appeared, Mr. Speaker, when asked, unlike the Leader of the Opposition, but the testimony of the Premier several Even weeks ago, I believe there were four or five different numbers that came forward from the OPA. I think, Mr. Speaker, all of us in this House realize the reasonable thing to do is to have the Auditor General, an officer of this Legislature, finish his report on the Oakville situation. That report was undertaken at the personal request of the Premier upon receiving office. Mr. Speaker, let us let the Auditor General do his work. I think the one thing that we found through the testimony at the Committee of Various Experts is this is a very complicated Answer. and technical matter. And Mr. Speaker, I think we should leave it with this fine uh, officer of the Legislature, the Auditor General. Thank you. A new question. The member from Trinity, Spadina. question is to the uh, Minister of Transportation. Yesterday, the Minister appeared to take a step back on high occupancy tolls. Well, the budget speech said that the government will commit to moving quickly to implement uh, tolls, the minister now says the government is not rushing into anything. Has the minister now realized that putting high occupancy tolls on hundreds of kilometres of Ontario's highways is an expensive and risky scheme that Metrolinx agrees is not a significant revenue source for transit? Mr. Transportation Infrastructure. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. No, we are not taking a step back, and no, we are not rushing into anything. We are going forward steadily down the path we committed to in the budget. And I'm sorry uh, that people in that party are feeling hoisted on their own petard with their confusing positions on transit that we're getting into this word detail. Let me read the budget, Mr. Speaker, very carefully so it's not lost in anyone. The province is committing to convert select high-occupancy vehicle lanes in the GTHA into high-occupancy toll lanes, HOV, HOT lanes, in which carpooling drivers would, and I want to emphasize, continue to drive for free, but other drivers would be able to choose to drive in these lanes for a toll. Toll-free options would exist on all highways that have HOV, HOT lanes. This model has been successfully implemented in several places, Mr. Yes, Speaker, including Florida, Texas, and California. Mr. Speaker, that's been published for quite a while now. I don't think it's complicated English. I'm sure the member opposite Thank understands you. it. Supplementary. No, I do. Say I appreciate the simplicity of the message. <laughs> the, the, uh, the Minister of Transportation and, and the Minister of Finance appear to be awfully optimistic about the revenue potential of high occupancy toll lanes. But in February, we learned that the new hot lanes in Washington, D.C., lost, lost over $11 million in just their first six weeks of operation. The Washington, D.C. hot lanes are only 14 miles long. Meanwhile, the province has committed to building up to 450 kilometers worth of hot lanes. Will the government stop wasting time with risky tolling scheme and instead focus on the real job of building new transportation options for Ontarians? Question. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker. Would the third party start futzing around and decide whether they're going to support what is the largest investment in infrastructure and transportation in the history of this province? We have more projects out there like the Anglican Crosstown, Mr. Speaker, which are quite frankly the largest just on its own transit project in the history of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We introduced HOV lanes in 2005. They've been a tremendous success. There were naysayers at the time. We are prudently looking at the experiences. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite's view is somewhat limited. California has had these for three years. They did not make money in the first year. By the second year, they were successful. By the third year, they're a roaring success, Mr. Speaker. And that was, and their, their evaluation was released just two weeks ago, Mr. Speaker. So yes, we are prudently looking at all the evidence, the experience of other places, and we will make sure Ontarians get solutions to their congestion Thank challenges, you Mr. Up. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Member from Mississauga East, Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. Last night I held a town hall in my riding of Mississauga East Cooksville, you. where we discussed the budget. And you know, some of the things we talked about, as you can imagine, was auto insurance, increased investments in home care, our infrastructure plans, our deficit control plans. But one area that generated a lot of interest, a lot of questions, Speaker, was our youth employment strategy. So would the Minister of Economic Development and Trade right please tell us? What plans we have in our budget to increase well-paying jobs for our young? Thank you, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga East Cooksville for her question and her hard work on this issue. Mr. Speaker, our budget proposes a comprehensive youth jobs strategy of $295 million over two years. And this strategy actually incorporates uh, many of the good suggestions that came from the NDP party, but goes substantially further on additional measures to help youth get jobs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our youth job strategy is designed to create employment opportunities for about 30,000 youth across the province and to promote entrepreneurship and innovation in Ontario. Our government's already begun consulting on the strategy. In fact, last Friday, I had the opp opportunity, together with the Minister from, from Training Colleges and Universities, to consult with about 30 individuals, business, union representatives, academics, obviously many youth themselves, uh, not-for-profit organizations, to talk about how we might refine the strategy so it's most impactful. I encourage both opposition parties to work with us to pass the budget so we can move forward with this important initiative. Absolutely. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. 
Reverend, and thank you, Minister, for your great response. And I just have, I want to give a shout out to all the people in my riding who came out for the town hall, despite the Leafs game. It was a great town hall. I just Absolutely. wanted to say that. Uh, now, now, I do want to say, the Speaker, that you know we are all about building our community. So as great as it is to have a good employment strategy for our youth, we want to make sure that we can employ our youth in the communities they live. So I'd like to ask the Minister what our plans are for our rural youth to make sure that they have equal opportunities for good, well-paying jobs. Thank you, Minister. To the Minister of Rural Affairs. Oh my gosh. The Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, and I want to commend the member from Mississauga's Cooksville for her wonderful leadership in her community. Mr. Speaker, a 2013 budget delivers for rural Ontario. The $295 million youth strategy will benefit young people across Ontario and will strengthen rural communities. In addition to this investment, our government has been helping to connect students with jobs in rural Ontario communities through our Rural Summer Jobs Service. Since 2007, this program has connected 18,000 students with jobs and helped over 7,000 rural employers. The Rural Summer Job Service is part of our government's Ontario Summer Job Strategy and is another way we're helping to promote innovation and entrepreneurship amongst our people. Mr. Speaker, I was in Havelock, Ontario last Saturday meeting with my good friend Albert Buchanan, and they're excited in Havelock about this summer job for rural youth. Question. The member from Renfrew, Nicholson, Kenbrook. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Deputy Premier. It's clear from your answers here in this House and the actions of your Liberal members of the Justice Committee that you have no interest in seeing the committee get to the bottom of the Oakville and Mississauga gas plant scandals. The public deserves accountability. They deserve to know how your government wasted $600 million. The Ontario Party has moved the want of confidence motion. If you'll agree to support our Opposition Day motion tomorrow, we can settle once and for all who stands for the people of Ontario and who stands to support the Liberal Party and its scandals. Premier, Acting Premier, will you do the right and proper thing? Will you support our Opposition Day motion and bring our want of confidence, yes, confidence motion to the floor of this legislature? Yes, Please. Acting Premier. To the Government House Leader. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the, the line of question that was pursued this morning, the, the answers that I've given in the House, there's nothing frivolous here, Mr. Speaker. The simple fact of the matter is that there is a concern about the cancellation of these gas plants. And the point that is trying we are trying to make is that every party of this house particularly the opposition party yes. aggressively campaigned that if the leader of the opposition became the premier he that he would do the exact same thing Maybe. he would cancel the plan mr speaker i believe those are relevant facts that the committee needs to know so we invited the leader of the opposition this morning in front of the committee we didn't ask him tough or technical questions mr speaker we simply asked him to a acknowledge the fact that not only did he appear in a video and hold a press conference and his candidates put up tweets, but to ask him about his costing and about the due diligence that he did. And 28 times, Mr. Speaker, he refused to answer Thank those you. direct questions. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Liberal Party has no, its track record is one of obfuscating and scandals, billions. Withdraw, please. Withdraw. Maybe, the, maybe the House Leader could withdraw the 30 times he said it. Now, please. The, member, the members of Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. The member, the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. The member from uh, Pembroke uh, will uh, just simply withdraw with no comment. Withdraw. You know, your Liberal track record is a laundry list of billions of dollars wasted after scandal after scandal. And whenever you're caught red-handed, you will conveniently say, we're going to set up this committee or that committee and, quote, this will never happen again. You know, the problem isn't just accountability, it's the arrogance of that government over there. If there's one thing that the people of Ontario can be sure of. Question. If you think you can get away with it, you'll do it again. So I'm asking you, given your record, once again, will you do the right thing? Tomorrow there's an Opposition Day motion that will bring a want of confidence motion to the floor of this Thank House. You. Let the people decide. Thank you. Stop the clock. You see it, please? You see it, please? 
Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, you want to talk about caught red-handed. This was the party that went out and paid for robocalls throughout thousands of homes saying the only way to stop the gas plant was to elect a PC government. This was a party that went out and held press conferences that dropped leaflets, Mr. Speaker, that say the only party that will and will underline stop the Sherway power plant is the Ontario PC party. On October 6, vote Ontario PC. Mr. Speaker, all all, the minimum that we wanted, Mr. Speaker, was for the Leader of the Opposition to at least acknowledge that position, a very public position, and 28 times, Mr. Speaker, he evaded that question in a series of simple questions about his due diligence and about his analysis. Answer. Mr. Speaker, there's a double standard going on here, and I think it's time that the Progressive Conservative Party stood up and acknowledged Thank the you. very simple fact that they opposed the principle. Thank you. New question, the member from Essex. The question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, more than a month after we learned about the errors in chemotherapy dosing, patients are still left with the most basic questions of what went wrong. We've seen a lot of finger-pointing, and it's only getting worse. This week, Marchese, the drug provider, threatened to sue the Windsor Regional Hospital for defamatory remarks after the hospital did its best to communicate the situation to its patients. My question is simple. Does the minister think that escalating conflict and finger pointing is benefiting patients in any way? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Uh, speaker, what I can tell you is that uh, my first and last concern has always been for the patients that are affected. Speaker, yeah. so that's why immediately upon learning about this underdosing issue, the appropriate steps were taken. Patients were notified. They had rapid meetings with their oncologist speaker. They had uh, group meetings where they could get answers to the questions that they, of course, had. Yeah. We set up a, a, a working group with all of the partners around the table who are working through the issue. Speaker, we've appointed a third-party investigator to look at the entire safety of our cancer uh, supply chain, our cancer drug supply chain. That work is well underway. Speaker, we owe it to the patients of Ontario, of not just the patients affected by this underdosing, but to all patients Answer. that we get answers to the very legitimate questions that they have. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, the minister's response would be, be all well and good if it wasn't simply after the fact that these measures were brought into place. Speaker, Ontario's patients seem to be the ones who continue to be left out of the equation. They want transparency, accountability, and answers of how this could have happened. This week, New Democrats urged the government to grant ombudsman's oversight over our health care system. Because, because patients need someone rooting for them and asking the tough questions. Speaker, will the minister finally make sure that someone is working for patients and grant ombudsman's oversight over our health care system. Uh, speaker, Ontarians have well deserved confidence in our health care yeah, system. Our cancer outcomes, uh, Speaker, are amongst the best in the world. So the safety of our cancer care system is beyond reproach, but we must always strive to make it better. Yeah. And whenever an issue arises that, can, that instructs us on how we can strengthen the system, I can assure you that we will move on those recommendations, Speaker. I mean, even the member from Nickel Belt acknowledges that Canada, Ontario, uh, an Ontarian who gets cancer has one of the best chances of survival anywhere in the world. Uh, the member from Nickel Belt said that we have an excellent health care system and an excellent cancer care system. Speaker, the member is right, and I have said over and over again we have an excellent system, but it's not a perfect system, and yeah. we are striving every day to make it better. Thank you. Question: The member from Ottawa, Orleans. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Minister, a strong northern Ontario economy is important not only for the people in northern communities but for the health of the province in general. Our government has been a strong supporter of the North and is taking action to address challenges such as job creation, revitalizing transportation infrastructure, and improving vital access to the Ring of Fire. Part of hel helping the northern economy grow is ensuring our largest job creators are supported. 
Will the minister please update the House on what our government is doing to help Northern in Industries? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Speaker, I thank the member for Ottawa Orleans for the question. And the member is right. Uh, a strong northern economy is vital for the province as a whole. That's why we introduced the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program in 2010 to assist Ontario's largest industrial electricity consumers reduce their energy costs. These firms are key economic contributors and job creators in the north. And this program supports their employees and communities while maintaining global competitiveness. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to helping the North succeed. That's why we announced in this year's budget that we are investing $360 million to extend the program an additional three years, thanks to the advocacy of our Northern Caucus members. And that's why the members opposite should be supporting this budget, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your response. I'm glad to hear that our government is continuing its strong support for northern communities with this investment. The Northern Industrial Electricity Rate has been an important program for large firms across the north as they grow and create jobs. But, Mr. Speaker, the global recession and its after effects have created unprecedented challenges for the north, especially the forestry sector. Can the minister provide more de details about this program extension and how it will help forestry and other sectors, sectors continue to thrive as the economy continues its recovery? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, uh, we are making a $360 million investment in Northern Ontario in this year's budget. The Northern Industrial Electricity Program was created to help key northern industries like forestry. It reduces energy bills for large consumers in the north by 25 per cent. In fact, since 2010, this rate, this rate program has created or protected nearly 16,000 jobs in the north. Those are jobs across 24 northern forestry, steel and mining-related facilities. As the member mentioned, these industries have faced unprecedented challenges through the global recession and its after-effects. So, Mr. Speaker, I hope all parties in this House stand with us and support the budget to help Northern Ontario residents. Thank, Thank you. you. New question, the member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the government House Leader. Today in the Justice Committee, investigating your government's gas plant scandal, things took an interesting turn. Your party adopted a new strategy. Instead of evading questions in Justice Committee, you have now undertaken to asking irrelevant questions. <laughs> the member from Vaughan asked question after question, unrelated to the true government costs and the cover-up that the government instituted, instead using his 30 minutes taking cheap political shots. The, the member will withdraw. I'll withdraw. This is a committee with a mandate to get to the bottom of a $600 million scandal and counting that leads directly to the Premier's office. So, Government House Leader, will, you take a will it take a judicial inquiry and the threat of jail time for this Premier and her party to start taking this matter seriously? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I I want to ask if the, if the questions were so irrelevant, why did the Leader of the Opposition not answer them, Mr. You're Speaker? The questions that we were asking, Mr. Speaker, were very straightforward. We asked why he was so aggressive in his campaign to cancel the gas plant, why he said if he was Premier he would cancel it. We asked similar questions to the ones they've asked our uh, members, Mr. Speaker. What kind of analysis and due diligence was done? Mr. Speaker, 20 Twenty-eight times questions Muhammad of that Ali nature were put Dome. to the Leader of the Opposition, and 28 times he avoided asking them. Mr. Speaker, if they are so irrelevant, I'm not sure why he would not be forthcoming. And, Mr. Speaker, if they are so irrelevant, I'm not sure why the PC candidates from that area are not forthcoming. Again, Answer. maybe in the supplementary, the member can talk about the efforts they're making to have those PC candidates come before the committee. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have a little message for the government House Leader. As the government corruption meter rises, so too do our message and for judicial inquiry, our calls for judicial inquiry grow louder, Mr. Speaker. After, after acknowledging YouTube videos and reading quotes, many quotes, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Liberals weren't getting the answers that they were looking for. The, the government House Leader 
uh, wanted the leader of Her Majesty's, he begged the leader of the, uh, or Her Majesty's loyal opposition to come to the Justice Committee, and this morning he did. What the Liberal Star witness said this morning is that the McGuinty Wynn government has not learned its lessons from the scandal and that they'll do it again if given the chance. That's right, Mr. Speaker. They will spend hundreds of millions of dollars to buy another election if given the chance. We expect the Premier and her office to act responsibly Question. and at least be truthful with the people of Ontario when her government officials come before a standing committee of this legislature. So, Government House Leader, will it take a threat of jail time to achieve some honesty from the party across? the aisle, or, are, or you. are you so committed? Thank you. Government House Leader. Major Leftoff. Proceeding, please. So, so Mr. Speaker, let me get this straight. When the Liberal Party in the last election promised to cancel the gas plant. It was the worst thing that's ever befallen this, uh, this society since the Macarena or the plague. And when the Progressive Conservative Party makes the exact same promise, Mr. Speaker, well, we don't want to talk about it. 28 times, Mr. Speaker, we asked the Leader of the Opposition just to simply acknowledge his position, and he wouldn't, Mr. Speaker. Why the double standard, Mr. Speaker? When it comes to ju judicial inquiry, Mr. Speaker, we are following the advice of the very own member who said the cost of a public inquiry is excessive. We don't believe that that's necessary. We're paid as individuals to represent our constituents and to hold the government, and that's where we expect this hearing to take place. I could not agree with the honourable member more. Your question, the member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, last week at the Elliott Lake Inquiry, a representative of the Ministry of Labour said the Ministry bore no responsibility for the tragedy in which Lucy Aylwin and Dolores Perizzolo tragically lost their lives. The Ministry official testified that the employer is responsible for the protection of their workers, but the workers are also responsible for their own safety. They also said that the Ministry official were a check on the system and could not be disciplined as a result of this disaster. To even imply that these two women were more responsible for their own protection in their place of work than the Ministry of Labour is ridiculous. The Ministry of Labour inspection offices were housed in the Algo Mall for 10 years but did little to address conditions in the leaking mall situation. Question. Mr. Speaker, will the minister call the Federal Occupational Health and Safety Inspectors to investigate the Ministry of Labour's role and recommend whether changes or other actions are warranted? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the, the member opposite for the question. Speaker, uh, as, you, as you know and as the House knows that the government has established the Elliott Lake Commission of Inquiry, uh, by, by establishing that public commission, the government has clearly demonstrated its commitment to an independent review of the circumstances surrounding the collapse of the Algo Center Mall. The commission, Speaker, is authorized to review the policies processes and procedures of the provincial government. This includes the policies and procedures of the, minist uh, the Ministry of Labour, which were addressed directly in evidence this past week. The government has been providing full and complete cooperation to the Commission in fulfilling its mandate and will continue to do so. The matter of the collapse of the Algo Centre Mall is now before the Commission Speaker, and the government is of the view that the Answer. Commission remains the proper forum for examining its issue. It would be inappropriate to comment on any evidence that has been heard by the inquiry, and of course the government looks Thank forward you. to the Commission's recommendations. Thank, Thank you, Speaker. You. Member from Bramley Gore Malton on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to invite the House to uh, join me in welcoming a good friend, an activist, and an organizer who founded a women's empowerment group and a cultural group that promotes Punjabi culture, Sumit Gorgil, to the House today. Thank you. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.